you know, Ezekiel is just such a fascinating book. It's like uh, every time I start preparing one of these, um, I'm like, you know, this is really interesting. This is really cool. And um, I was talking to a couple guys before church, and I realized, as I said that, I do that every time I start preparing. And I think that speaks to God's Word and just how, uh, how wonderful and unique it is. But uh, before we get started, let's pray. Um, Lord, we thank you for tonight. Lord, thank you that you are sovereign. Lord, I pray that you'll just use your word to teach us and to show us your ways and to bring us closer to you, Lord. I pray that you'll just be with us especially. You'll speak the message that you have for each individual heart tonight here, Lord, and that thy will be done. Thank you for, again for your word. Thank you for your son and all that you've done for us. In his precious name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. So Ezekiel, um, as I've said several times, um, if you take the 30,000 foot view, uh, it's a book about the sovereignty and glory of God uh, that's seen all through the book. Um, we've seen God saying, I did this and I did that and um, many other ways where you see who's really in control. We think we're in control, but we're actually not in control. God is really in control. And then... Um, also, we notice that uh, about 70 times in the book occurs the phrase, Know that I am the Lord. Um, in chapters 1 through 3, we saw the throne of God, Ezekiel's call and his acting out, the things that God told him to act out. Chapters 4 through 24 are God's judgment or, or chastisement on Jerusalem, and that's what Ezekiel's warning about. So we're not too far to where all this judgment on Jerusalem and Israel is uh, going to be covered. And it's going to jump into the judgment of the nations. And then as we near the end of the book, we're going to see the millennium and the millennial temple and all kind of cool and wonderful things. So Ezekiel, is, it really is a really, really fun book. Um, the phrase, know that I'm the Lord, we have seen that 19 times so far through the end of chapter 18. We're going to see it numerous times tonight. So I think it's important to kind of keep Ezekiel in mind as to sort of what the backdrop theme in all of uh, this book is. So let's get started, chapter 19, verse 1. More, uh, moreover, take up a lamentation for the princes of Israel and say, What is your mother, a lioness? She lay down among the lions. Among the young lions she nourished her cubs. She brought up one of her cubs, and he became a young lion. He learned to catch prey, and he devoured men. The nations also heard of him. He trapped him. He was trapped in their pit, and they brought him with change to the land of Egypt. Um, God says, take up a lamentation. We need to notice this is actually God's lamentation. It's not Ezekiel's lamentation. It's not Jeremiah's lamentation like we saw the book of Lamentations. This is actually God lamenting and using illustrations of what's happened with uh, their princes or, or their kings. Um, the lioness, of course, would be Israel or um, Judah. Um, verses 1 through 9, we're going to see the lamentation of the princes or rulers. And then um, we're going to see the lamentation of Judah in verses 10 through 14. But it, it's very, very interesting here to see how God laid all this out. Um, he said that Israel, the, represented by the lion, is laid down among the lions. Because Israel was supposed to be separate and kept separate from the other nations. But what did Israel do? They laid down with the other nations and adopted their ways and all, which were totally apart from what God wanted them to be because they were supposed to be very, very separate. Um, so what king was taken to Egypt in chains, as this says, and that would be um, Jehoiaz, who uh, Pharaoh Necho dragged over to um, Egypt in chains. He was the first whelp spoken of here, so to speak. And... Um, when we think of somebody being taken away in chains, we tend to think of their hands and their ankles in chains, but that's not the way they did it. They would oftentimes actually put a hook in their nose and drag their captives away. And um, you can actually see this on petroglyphs in museums where they would actually portray how, the, how they would do this. It was very, very cruel times. Uh, moving on to uh, verse 5. When she saw that she waited, that her hope was lost, she took another of her cubs and made him a young lion. And he roved among the lions, and he became a young lion. He learned to catch prey. He devoured men. He knew their desolate places and laid waste their cities. The land with his fullness was desolated by the noise of his roaring. So we noticed here she hoped, she waited. It's a way of saying that, you know, 
Israel thought their king was going to be the answer to their problems and solve their problems and set them free and all that kind of stuff. But it turns out that the hope was lost in this king as well. And, you know, it should make us ask, well, now wait a minute, you know, Israel was thinking that. Who am I depending on to rescue me and to take care of me? And there's only one we should be counting on. There's only one who's able to do that. And that's God himself. And Jesus promised to never leave us or forsake us. So whatever we're going through, no matter how bad it may seem to us, he's got his reasons. And he should be the one that we're depending on. But uh, here, the second cub is uh, King Jehoiachin, who was an absolute monster, the things that he did. He's the one, if you remember back in Jeremiah, that God placed a blood curse on him and his descendants. And that's really interesting when you think about God's promise to David that there would always be a king on David's throne <laughs> because you would think, at least in theory, that God putting a blood curse on him and his descendants would cut that line. But God has some very unique ways that uh, he got around that. So uh, it makes the genealogy of Jesus in Matthew and Luke very, very interesting, which is a, a study all its own. But uh, anyway, we see how these kings were cut off, and then Zedekiah came in, and we're going to see a little bit more about him as well later. So verse 8. Then the nation set against him from the provinces on every side and spread their net over him. He was trapped in their pit. They put him in a cage with chains and brought him to the king of Babylon. They brought him in nets that his voice should no longer be heard on of Israel. So again, this is Jehoiachin, who unlike um, Jehoaz, who was taken to Egypt in chains, he was actually knitted and caged and taken to uh, Babylon, where we know he was actually in prison there for 37 years. So... You know, there's a lot going on there with their kings who were no better than the people. It had just became, things had become really, really bad. Uh, verse 10, your mother was like a vine in your bloodline, planted by the waters, fruitful and full of branches because of many waters. She had strong branches for scepters of rulers. She towered in stature above the thick branches and was seen in her height amid the dense foliage. But she was plucked up in fury. She was cast down to the ground, and the east wind dried her fruit. Her strong branches were broken and withered. The fire consumed them. So the, the, the vine here, of course, is Israel, which is seen many, many times in uh, the Bible. Uh, one of the most prominent uh, portraying Israel uh, as a vine is found in Isaiah chapter 5. We also, it's interesting to see here, planted by the waters, fruitful, full of branches, many waters. This speaks to God's provision for the nation and how well he provided for them and how much he loved them and all. And yet, you know, we see their, their rebellion in spite of all that. The east wind spoken of here would, of course, be Nebuchadnezzar. And plucked up speaks of a, a fairly sudden uh, national judgment, not just some people, but, uh, but plucked up as a nation. Actually, the whole nation uh, came under judgment. It's also very interesting to see the scepter here. Uh, the scepter represents capital punishment which the Jews had up until um, the times of the Romans. Uh, there's a verse in Genesis 49.10. The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet, until Shiloh comes, which is speaking to the Messiah, and to him shall be the obedience of all the people. And it's really interesting to think about this scepter, the right for capital punishment. Um, if we think about... Um, the rabbis and what was happening at the time of Jesus, it gets even more and more interesting. Um, there's a verse in um, Luke 2, 42 through 43 that says, speaking of Jesus, And when he was 12 years old, they went up to Jerusalem according to the custom of the feast. When they had finished the days, as they returned, the boy Jesus lingered behind in Jerusalem, and Joseph and his mother did not know it. So you remember this. This is when they lost Jesus. Can you imagine uh, being entrusted with the very Son of God and losing him? So I'm sure they were quite panic-stricken, and of course they found him in the temple. And um, they found him in the temple, and he was actually asking questions, and they marveled at his wisdom, even when he's just 12 years old. And I, I have a theory. I can't prove it. If we ask ourselves, at that time, who would have known that Jesus was on the scene and that he was the Messiah? Well, of course, Mary and Joseph knew. Uh, the shepherds knew at his birth. The wise men knew. And if you look at Luke chapter 2, you'll find Anna, a prophetess, who knew. And Simeon, who knew. 
And then, of course, later John the Baptist would know. But the Romans took away the scepter, the right for capital punishment, from the Jews in about A.D. 15. And it's said and it's recorded that the rabbis, when this happened, they rent their clothes, they were throwing, you know, dust on themselves, they were bewailing because they thought that the scepter had departed but the Messiah hadn't came yet. They thought God's word had been broken. So they were really lamenting and wailing all this. And what they didn't realize is, because they weren't paying attention at his birth, or they would have known, they weren't paying attention to Daniel, Daniel chapter 9, or they would have known that the day wasn't very far away when he was going to be riding into Jerusalem on that donkey because Daniel predicted the very day. So they're bewailing and moaning, and little did they know that in a carpenter shop up in Nazareth, Shiloh had came. They just didn't recognize him. So it's really, really, it's really sad how things went down there. But I have a personal theory, and like I said, I couldn't, I, I couldn't prove it. But when Jesus was there in the temple, I suspect that the scepter was taken from them after that. Because that would have been an incident that even despite their missing his birth and then missing the other things, he had actually been to the temple. So it's like his arrival had sort of been, in, I'm using my own words here, kind of formally announced in Jerusalem. And yet, <clears throat> excuse me, and yet they missed that. So you have these poor guys thinking the word of God had actually been broken. When if they had just done their homework and known what they should have known, they would know that actually Messiah was on the scene. The scepter departed, but Shiloh had come. So it's just a, a really good reminder that God's word is absolutely, positively never broken, and they should have known better. Verse 13. And now she is planted in the wilderness in a dry and thirsty land. Fire has come out from a rod of her branches and devoured her fruit, so that she has no strong branch, a scepter for ruling. This is a lamentation and has become a lamentation. Um, Chaldea was actually a very green and fertile land. Um, God obviously here is speaking spiritually. And certainly Israel, spiritually speaking, was very dry and very thirsty. Um, it's interesting that uh, it talks about no strong branch and uh, all this as relating to the kings and their leaders and all. Zedekiah had taken an oath to Nebuchadnezzar. He was really a puppet king. He had taken an oath to Nebuchadnezzar that he would oversee Jerusalem, but he would be subservient, as would the city, to Nebuchadnezzar. And he made himself a liar when he started rebellion, again, rebelling against Nebuchadnezzar. And that's bad enough, but when you go back and read what he did, he actually offered a sacrifice to God as part of his oath and his oath to Nebuchadnezzar. So now he's involved God in that vow or that oath which he breaks. And God takes vows very, very seriously. So when he did that, he involved God, which then obviously would, so to speak, make God look bad. And God took that very, very seriously. So we all know how Zedekiah was, uh, was judged and what happened to him, which was uh, actually horrible. So if we think about it, with all of these kings being taken to Egypt and to Babylon and Zedekiah, you know, his eyes put out and dragged to Babylon and all that, seemingly the Davidic line has come to a stop because with the blood curse on Jeconiah, there's no one to, um, to carry it on. But obviously God's smarter than that and he had a secret plan, which we now know the story. But speaking of um, chastisement, we're going we're gonna to see more chastisement and judgment in uh, chapter 20. So, you know, Romans 15.4 says, whatever things were written aforetime were written for our learning. So we look at the Old Testament and sometimes we don't really understand why these stories and why all this stuff is there. But it's very, very important. If we'll take a look at it and gain some understanding, God has something to in every single passage that's, that's you know, applicable to us. So if we think about it, why so much judgment and chastisement of Israel in the Bible? Um, I, I had said before, if you take the parts of Isaiah and the whole book of Jeremiah and uh, about half of Ezekiel, it's a significant chunk of the Bible and you think that's a lot about 
the judgment and chastisement of Israel. And I think it speaks to how bad they were actually in their sin. But I think it also speaks to God's sovereignty and omnipotence to show us through all of this that he's sovereign and he rules over the affairs of men. It also shows us his holiness and how much he hates sin and all the things that they were doing. It also shows us his love because he did not want them living in sin. They were his chosen people and he wanted them to be set apart and his representatives on earth, which we'll also talk about later. Um, so he was showing them their sin and obviously it had to be judged because he's a holy God and they just couldn't go on like that. God was going to use these people to bring his Messiah. Well, if they were involved in adultery and cheating one another and idol worship, how, how would he bring the Messiah out if they were behaving like that? So he knows what it will take to get us in line. So again, kind of speaking to his sovereignty. <clears throat> it also speaks to his omniscience and his omnipotence. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, his omniscience and omnipresence because we saw several times where he would tell the priest or he would tell this person or this group what they were doing and what, even what they were thinking which really speaks to that, and I, I think that's really, really interesting. So when we think about their idol worship and all they were doing and the chastisement that's coming, uh, I just remind myself that we become like the gods we worship, which is seen in both Psalm 115 and 135, pretty specifically states that. So they were becoming like these gods they were worshiping, and if you flip that coin over and you're worshiping the one true and living God, Jesus, that means you'll become like him. So when we become like the gods we worship, let's be very careful on, on who we're worshiping. Um, we also see the principle here of sowing and reaping, though. I mean, they were sowing all, this, all these uh, idolatrous practices and all this sin, which they knew was sin, and now they're, they're, they're reaping. The harvest has come, and they're starting to reap all this. Um, and we have to remember, God chastens those he loves. If he didn't love them, he, he wouldn't have put all of this on them. So, and that certainly is very, very applicable to us. So moving on to chapter 20, um, verse 1. It came to pass in the seventh year, in the fifth month, on the tenth day of the month, that certain of the elders of Israel came to inquire of the Lord and sat before me. Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, speak to the elders of Israel and say to them, Thus says the Lord God, Have you come to inquire of me? As I live, says the Lord God, I will not be inquired of by you. Will you judge them, son of man? Will you judge them? Then make known to them the abominations of their fathers. So it's interesting that Ezekiel gives us a specific date here. The last time we saw a date was back in chapter 8. So this is about a year after chapter 8. It's easy to read through these books and think these things are happening fairly quickly, you know, in a few days or a few months. But actually years are going by as you read through these uh, various books. And again, this is about a year after uh, chapter 8. Um, this also tells us that the elders recognized Ezekiel as a priest and prophet because it was very common for the leaders to inquire of a, peace, a priest or prophet what God would have to say to them. Uh, and if you look in Deuteronomy 17 verses 9 through 12, it very specifically, God gave them instructions that they could do that. So what they were doing was okay. It's just who had they been listening to? They had been listening to the false prophets who told them what they wanted to hear, not to Jeremiah, not to Ezekiel. And it speaks to their moral state, uh, which has been thoroughly reviewed because God knew their heart. He knew their moral state. And almost, it's almost as if God is saying, how dare you come to me now asking questions when you're still doing all the things that you're doing. But, you know, it made me stop and ask myself, can you imagine if God... I'll just use myself. If God were to tell me, I, I don't, I don't ask me questions. I won't be inquired of by you. How horrible that must have been for them to hear those words, you know. But fortunately, He's never going to tell any of us that, because we're, we know that we can come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. And that's all because of Jesus and what He did. Oh, indeed, what a Savior we have. We don't ever have to worry about God telling us that. He may tell us a lot of things we don't want to hear, and he may show us some things we really don't want to see about ourselves, but he's not going to turn us away and say, don't talk to me. So, good news, good news. Uh, verse 5. 
Say to them, Thus says the Lord God, On the day when I chose Israel and raised my hand in an oath to the descendants of the house of Jacob and made myself known to them in the land of Egypt, I raised my hand in an oath to them, saying, I am the Lord your God. On that day I raised my hand in an oath to them to bring them out of the land of Egypt into a land that I searched out for them, flowing with milk and honey, the glory of all lands. Truly isn't Israel the glory of all lands. I was thinking about that. And, you know, not only did God give it to his chosen people, God has a, a very special affinity for that land. And it's his land. And when people mess with it today and try to divide it and do all these things, they're, they're actually kind of shaking their finger in the eyes of God. It is the glory of all lands. But I realize, at least to me, what really makes it the glory of all lands on our planet is because that's where Jesus lived. So it's the glory of all lands in, in multiple ways. Moving on, verse 7. Then I said to them, Each of you, throw away your abominations which are before his eyes, and do not defile yourselves with the idols of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. So here we see God has begun um, laying out his case against them, his review, his oaths, and the, and the call and the plan of what he was planning to do for them. And then we'll see towards the end his response and actually... Um, like God always does, it ends in mercy and grace. And he tells them about what a glorious future that they actually have. But first, we're going we're gonna to see a lot of God's judicial case against them because of what they were doing. Um, their history has been rebellion, rebellion, rebellion. You know, he chose them just like he chose us. Jesus told his disciples, you didn't choose me. You might think you did, but you didn't. I chose you. And he chose the nation, and yet... We see rebellion after rebellion after rebellion. And, you know, man always rebels. Always. That's why we need a Savior. That's why Jesus came, you know. So they were also contaminated in Egypt. They, that golden calf wasn't a new idea. They had picked that up in Egypt. And as you study this, you find out that they actually picked up idol worship from almost all the surrounding nations and incorporated it. And that's, uh, you know, what God is uh, speaking of here. Also speaking of Egypt, it's interesting... Um, Friday the 13th, some people don't realize where that came from. When um, the last of the plagues that uh, Moses was involved in was where the firstborn uh, was slaughtered. And for their protection, they were to uh, take uh, blood and put on their doorway, which when they marked the doorway would have been in the shape of a cross. And that actually, the angel then passed over, which now they celebrate as Passover. But what's really interesting is that was on the 14th of Nisan, which to us was a Friday the 13th. And that's, that's where that came from. So believe it or not, that, that thing about that is actually that old. <laughs> it goes back that far. Uh, verse 8. But they rebelled against me and would not obey me. They did not all cast away the abominations which were before their eyes, nor did they forsake the idols of Egypt. Then I said, I will pour out my fury on them and fulfill my anger against them in the midst of the land of Egypt. But I acted for my name's sake that it should not be profaned before the Gentiles among whom they were, in whose sight I had made myself known to them to bring them out of the land of Egypt. Notice here God says that he did this for his name's sake. God protects his name, especially when it involves his chosen people. So we need to be careful not to profane it. God's intention was to show himself as the one true and living God and how strong he was in that he could deliver these people. And he did deliver them. And what do they do? They start taking up the customs of the surrounding nations and idol worship and all, but he's a merciful God. So he is willing to act in his namesake to, to preserve it, which is wonderful, wonderful news for us. But when we think about profaning God's name, uh, he does not want us profaning his name before the lost. It's about ambassadorship. Um, we, know, we know one of the commandments, do not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. We're his representatives on earth, and we need to take that seriously. Don't take his name in vain. Don't be doing things that, that he would not want you to be doing. It's, it's just a horrible witness to, uh, to the lost. Verse 10, Therefore I made them go out of the land of Egypt and brought them into the wilderness. And I gave them my statutes and showed them my judgments, which if a man does, he shall live by them. Moreover, I also gave them my Sabbaths to be a sign between them and me, that they might know that I am the Lord who sanctifies them. So these statutes and judgments and all and Sabbaths um, 
we know are the Ten Commandments, the Law. The Sabbath speak of uniqueness. Um, the, the Jewish religion is the only religion that had a Sabbath, that had a day of rest. Everybody else worked seven days a week. But they were supposed to take that one day and dedicate it to God, do no work, and rest, just like he had set the Sabbath up. The Sabbath isn't just from the law. The Sabbath actually goes back to Genesis, when God rested on the seventh day. That's where its roots are. So man basically was supposed to follow that model and have a day of rest from the very, very beginning. So it's obviously important to God. The word Sabbath, this is really interesting, occurs six times in this chapter. Uh, it's 135 times in the Bible, so obviously it's something that's pretty pretty important. Um, in Matthew 12, 8, uh, it, it tells us that where Jesus said, He is the Lord of the Sabbath. And Mark 2, 27 says the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. And I find it interesting that six days we work, the number of man, and then comes the seventh day, which is God's day. And I find that really, really interesting when you think about these numbers and seven, the number of completion, and uh, six being the number of man. It just always amazes me how these numbers are so consistent in their representations through the Bible. It's also interesting here to notice that um, the law is a source of life. And even though we can't keep it, we know that those rules are right. They are the right things to do. And we should always keep that. We're not under the law, and we know we can't keep it, but that doesn't mean that uh, you shouldn't be trying to uh, stay away from, from any of the sin that God spells out in the Bible. In fact, Romans 6.15 says, this is Paul talking, What then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law? Certainly not. Or I think the, the, the King James says, God forbid. So just because we're not under the law doesn't mean we're free to do whatever we want and whatever sins we want to commit. It's also interesting in verse 12, um, God says, know that I am the Lord who sanctifies them. And it's important for us to remember who's doing the sanctifying of us. Uh, we think of salvation, which is actually a somewhat a vague term. Salvation actually has three tenses, justification, sanctification, and glorification. Justification being when we were saved. Jesus did all the work for that. There's nothing we can do to add to it. We can't earn it. We can't buy it. He did all the work. Justification solely belongs to him. But sanctification is what God then begins after we're justified to conform us into the image of his son. So that's, that's a day-to-day -day process. And then uh, once we're raptured or if we die and we're resurrected, whenever we go to meet him, then we're actually going to be glorified and, and we shall be like him. So it's, it's really cool when you think about what God did for us through the process of salvation and all of its components. Verse 13, yet the house of Israel rebelled against me in the wilderness. They did not walk in my statutes. They despised my judgments, which if a man does, he shall live by them. And they greatly defiled my Sabbaths. Then I said I would pour out my fury on them in the wilderness to consume them. But I acted for my name's sake that it should not be profaned before the Gentiles in whose sight I had brought them out. So I also raised my hand in an oath to them in the wilderness that I would not bring them into the land which I had given them, flowing with milk and honey, the glory of all lands. There it is again. Because they despised my judgments and did not walk in my statutes, but profaned my Sabbaths, for their heart went after idols. So again, you know, what about us? What is our heart going for? Um, God's kids profaning his name word, with our words and behavior and everything that we do. We have to be very, very careful uh, to be mindful not to do that. There's a great verse in Proverbs. Remove falsehood and lies far from me. Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with the food allotted to me, lest I be full and deny you and say, Who is the Lord? Or lest I be poor and steal and profane the name of my God. And if we look at the super rich today, as a general rule, there are certainly some exceptions, what is their attitude? They don't know God, they don't want to know God, and they don't care. Because they have so many worldly possessions and so much money, they feel like they don't need God. And I think that's why Jesus told his disciples it's easier for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to be saved. Because they don't, they don't see any need they have. And little do they realize... They probably need him more than the, the, so to speak, than the poor people do because they're so lost and blind. So it's really interesting. So 
our goal should not to be rich nor poor, but somewhere in the middle, just where, where God would have us to be. So I think we have to be careful what we wish for, too. Verse 17. Nevertheless, and think about it. So God's talked about this judgment and all this stuff that's going on, but now we have the word nevertheless. So we're about to see his grace. So don't ever let anyone say that they're, you know, the God of the New Testament is grace, the God of the Old Testament is judgment. That's not true. There's grace all through the Old Testament if you're reading it and paying attention. So grace, or nevertheless, my eye spared them from destruction. I did not make an end of them in the wilderness. But I said to their children in the wilderness, do not walk in the statutes of your fathers, nor observe their judgments, nor defile yourself with idols. I am the Lord your God, walk in my statutes, keep my judgments and do them. Hallow my Sabbaths and they will be a sign between me and you, that you may know that I am the Lord. There we've seen that twice just in this, this, these uh, few verses. And again, we're seeing the rebellion in them. And it turned out even their children rebelled as well. The parents didn't get to enter the promised land, the children did, but even the children started rebelling. If we t take a closer look at this... Um, when the 12 spies went in, they went in for 40 days. They came back and 10 of them gave an evil report. Two of them gave a good report. And they didn't trust God. And it's just kind of mind-blowing here in Numbers 14. So all the, con so they had, the 12 spies had came and they had said, Oh no, we're scared. We can't go in. Which means they didn't trust God to deliver them. So all the congregation lifted up their voices and cried. And the people wept that night. And all the children of Israel complained against Moses and Aaron. And the whole congregation said to them, If only we had died in the land of Egypt, or if only we had died in this wilderness. Why has the Lord brought us to this land to fall by the sword, that our wives and children should become victims? Would it not be better for us to return to Egypt? So they said to one another, Let us select a leader and return to Egypt. Then the Lord said to Moses, How long will these people reject me, and how long will they not believe me? with all the signs which I performed among them. I mean, these people saw the plagues in Egypt. They saw the Red Sea parted. They saw the Shekinah glory of God as a cloud, cloud by day to protect them from the heat and the sun, a pillar of fire by night to give them heat and light. And they get to the promised land. They hear 10 guys say, we can't go in. And they get scared. And all of a sudden, it's like they forgot all, that, all those miracles that God had done for them. And they were going to go back to Egypt? back into slavery, it's just, it's just kind of mind-blowing. Um, another thing which wouldn't necessarily be so big a deal in our minds, but it was to God, is another sign of the, the oath, the covenant between them, in addition to the Sabbaths and the law and all, was they were supposed to be circumcising the, the males when they were born. And they didn't do that. And Joshua 5, 4 says, And this is the reason why Joshua circumcised them. All the people who came out of Egypt, who were males, all the men of war, had died in the wilderness on the way after they had come in out of Egypt, and they didn't do what God had told them to do. So it's as if from God's perspective, he's looking back and he's seeing nothing but rebellion, rebellion, rebellion. And now even the second generation is rebelling in the wilderness. And I think a really, really important verse that we should never forget occurs in 1 Samuel 15, 23. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. So if God's told us something and we're rebelling against it, or we're living a lifestyle in rebellion to what we know is right, God looks on that as witchcraft. We don't think of ourselves as practicing witchcraft. But if we're rebelling, it's actually a form of witchcraft, which... It's, it's quite a thought, at least in my mind. So we really need to pay attention here. This also helps us understand why David would pray, Lord, please search me and know me and show me if there's any wicked way in me. And that should certainly be um, our prayer too. Uh, verse 21. Notwithstanding, the children rebelled against me. They did not walk in my statutes and were not careful to observe my judgments, which, if a man does, he shall live by them. It's the third time God said that. That tells you how good the law actually is. If we follow those Ten Commandments and do what God says, we're going to live. He promised we will live, we will be prosperous. So I think it's important that, that God said that three times. But they profaned my Sabbaths, 
Then I said I would pour out my fury on them and fulfill my anger against them in the wilderness. Nevertheless, I withdrew my hand and acted for my name's sake. There's that mercy and grace again. That it should not be profaned in the sight of the Gentiles in whose sight I had brought them out. Also, I raised my hand in an oath to those in the wilderness that I would scatter them among the Gentiles and disperse them through the countries because they had not executed my judgment but had despised my statutes, profaned my Sabbaths, and their eyes were fixed on their father's <laughs> idols. So their children, despite all that happened and the parents not being able to enter the promised land, picked up the same bad ways. So we see this pattern. Rebellion, rebellion, rebellion. Their reaction to the spies report, the wilderness wanderings. We know what happened in the northern kingdom as the Assyrians came in and conquered them. We're now seeing what's happened to the southern kingdom with uh, the Babylonians and King, King Nebuchadnezzar come in. So we see that pattern over and over and over again. And if you look over mankind's history, you see that pattern repeating you know, throughout mankind other than um, even these things. Uh, moving on to verse 25. Therefore I also gave them up to the statutes that were not good and judgments by which they could not live. In other words, God's saying, you don't want to follow my, my statutes and my judgments by which you can live? Then go do what you want to do. It's like he, just, he gave them over and said, then you know what, just, just go do it. And I pronounced them unclean because of their ritual gifts in that they caused all their firstborn to pass through the fire that I make them that I might make them desolate and that they might know that I am the Lord and that passing through the fire we've talked of before is they would heat up this metal statue of Molech and they would actually lay their firstborn males on this statue as a sacrifice to Molech in addition to all the other stuff they were doing so you know sometimes you see that sin is its own punishment um, I guess one of the classic examples of that would be going to jail for something you did wrong. But also, can you imagine sacrificing and then having to go home knowing that your son was dead and that you had murdered him? I, I can't even really imagine that. If you look at Psalm 81, uh, verses 11 through 13, it's so reminiscent of this passage. But my people would not heed my voice, and Israel would have none of me. So I gave them over to their own stubborn heart to walk in their own counsels. Oh, that my people would listen to me, that Israel would walk in my ways. And you just hear how heartbroken God is there. He told them and told them, encouraged them, he blessed them and gave them all such wonderful gifts and promises and all. And they just kept blowing it time after time. So, you know, we need to keep that in mind with all the blessings that he's given us and hopefully we're using them for his glory. But that was the Old Testament. What about the New Testament? And it's really interesting as um, Romans chapter 1 opens up, it talks about um, men denying God and denying Him as Creator. And then as you read down through that and you come to verse 28, it says, And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, notice it didn't say they didn't have God in their knowledge, but they didn't retain Him. This passage tells us that everybody knows there's a God. They choose to not believe it. They deny it, but they do know. Um, so anyway, even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a debased mind to do those things which are not fitting, being filled with all unrighteousness, sexual immorality, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, evil-mindedness. They are whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, violent, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, undiscerning, untrustworthy, unloving, unforgiving, unmerciful, who knowing the righteous judgment of God, that those who practice such things are deserving of death, not only do the same, but also approve of those who practice them. So this is a, such a bold testament that when people refuse to acknowledge God and refuse to believe in Him, Ultimately, this is how they start winding up. And we see that play out in so many people and groups in our society today. It's actually um, very, very sad when you think about it. Um, verse 27. Therefore, son of man, speak to the house of Israel and say to them, Thus says the Lord God, In this too your fathers have blasphemed me by being unfaithful to me. When I brought them into the land concerning which I had raised my hand and an oath to give them, and they saw all the high hills and all the thick trees, there they offered their sacrifices and provoked me with their offerings. 
There they also set up their sweet aroma and poured out their drink offerings. Then I said to them, What is this high place to which you go? So its name is called Bama to this day. Again, the high groves and, um, I'm sorry, the high places and groves is where they would go and they would actually carve trees and things into phallic images and then they would go and worship these, um, these idols and false images which we know demons are behind all of those things and along with that would go all kinds of sexual activity and all kinds of, all of things. And to make matters worse, they were actually mixing their offerings. So they were doing offerings to God Jehovah and they were also doing these offerings to these false gods and these idols which infuriated God even more because now he's, it's almost as if he's, they're trying to involve him in what they were doing. Um, Bama is an interesting word. It's actually a contemptuous pun that Ezekiel Mace makes here. If you look down at the root, Ba means to go. Ma means where. It's like Bama is, is saying, where is this going nowhere place you're trying to get to? In other words, you're out of your mind. You're crazy. You can't do that and have me. You know what I mean? So, again having no false gods before him. So we'll move a little further and then wrap it up here. Um, verse 30. Therefore say to the house of Israel, Thus says the Lord God, Are you defiling yourselves in the manner of your fathers and committing harlotry according to their abominations? For when you offer your gifts and make your sons pass through the fire, you defile yourselves with all your idols even to this day. So shall I be inquired by of by you, O house of Israel? As I live, says the Lord God, I will not be inquired of by you. What you have in your mind shall never be when you say, We will be like the Gentiles, like the families of other countries, serving wood and stone. Again, we just talked about all this offering they were doing to idols in the Moloch worship. But this is just... It's such a sad verse. It's just fascinating when you think about it. So the people of Israel had actually said, we will be like the Gentiles, like the families in other countries, serving wood and stone. After all that God had done for them, for them to take that attitude is just really kind of mind-boggling. Um, and yet, you know, God's love, grace, and mercy, he saw them through. And um, he carried him on. So, you know, again, God chast chastens us not because he's mean. He does not want us acting like the Gentile nations. He does not want us acting like the unsaved. And I think it's important for us to remember, as I've said before, if he didn't love us, he wouldn't chasten us. So if we get wrapped up in some sin or we're doing something especially repetitive, he loves us enough to put us in circumstances and to somehow bring something in our lives to point that out to us and drive him back, drive us back to him, and he's always willing to forgive. John, First uh, John one nine is has been called the Christian's bar of soap, and that's where it says, if we will confess our sins, he is faithful and true to forgive us. So he chastens us with the intention of driving us not away from him, but to him so that we can confess and truly repent and stop doing that. So even when we're being chastened, it's just a testament not only of his love, but there's another piece of great news there. It also tells us that we're his kid. Because you don't see people chastening their neighbor's children. I mean, they, they might a little bit, but you know what I'm saying. They're not going to get into any heavy punishment of kids that they don't know. So when we're chastened, it's a little bit difficult, but remember, you know what? I might not like this, but this is actual proof that I'm God's kid and he loves me. So why don't, why don't we close there at the end of verse 32. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much that you do love us and that you do love us enough to chasten us when we're messing up, Lord. Thank you for your wondrous and miraculous love as you demonstrated on that cross when Jesus shed his blood and took on the sin of the entire world, Lord. He took on our sin so that we might live and we might get to know you. And Lord, may we live in love, love one another, and even love our enemies. And Lord, may, may what we do bring glory and honor and praise to you and to your name. And Lord, please, please help us to never be like the Gentiles, to never to be like the lost, Lord. Help us to act and be like your kids. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.